Welcome. We welcome everyone to our time of worship here this morning here at Freedland Moravian Church. Whether you're gathered here on our, on our church lawn or at home watching on our live, live stream on Facebook, or if you're nearby here in our parking lot listening on 87.9 FM, welcome we extend to everybody this morning. And there are a few announcements to share with you. We send our heartfelt condolences to the family and the friends of Pat Stewart, who entered into the immediate presence of the Lord this past Wednesday, September the 2nd. And there will be a small graveside service here at Freedland coming up on Friday, September the 11th at 11 a.m. We pray that God may grant comfort and peace to her husband, Donald, and to all of the family during this time of loss. Also remember that tomorrow is Labor Day. The church office will be closed for the holiday. We do pray for all those who are traveling throughout this long weekend. And next Sunday, September 13th, we will have our Workers' Love Feast during worship here, although with some changes to the Love Feast. We will have buns, individually wrapped Love Feast buns, provided for you in baggies here. But please be sure to bring a beverage with you to go with your bun. We will not have our traditional Love Feast coffee available. We will have bottled water available, though, as well, if you need water to drink that day. Also remember that we are collecting non-perishable food on these Sundays of September, with these food offerings deliver delivered to Sunnyside Ministry to help those most in need in our community during this time. There is a collection box available here. It's right here by the bulletins, as you'll have We'll see you here on the sidewalk. And all families are encouraged to bring food offerings to donate. And non-perishable food may also be brought to the church office here during the week. We are grateful for everybody's help and for your tremendous generosity during this time. We enter our time of worship with the words of our soloist hymn, O God of Every Nation. Yes. 
Christmas reign, and Christ shall rule victorious o'er all the world's domain. We join together in our responsive reading, a reading of Psalm 46, found printed on your bulletin. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. And our scripture readings for this Sunday, beginning with our psalm of the day from Psalm 119, verses 33 through 40. As the psalmist writes, Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will observe it to the end. Give me understanding, that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Turn your heart, my heart, to your decrees, and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at vanities. Give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant your promise, which is for those who fear you. Turn away the disgrace that I dread, for your ordinances are good. See, I have longed for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. In our epistle lesson from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 13, verses 8 through 14. As Paul writes, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore, Love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let, then, let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. 
Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. May God bless the reading and hearing of God's holy word for this Sunday. Good morning. Welcome again to worship this morning. Uh, it's now time for our children's message, so I invite all of the young in body and young in spirit to gather around wherever you are and however you might be able to this morning as we meditate on the words of Jesus. So I have a small favor to ask of you all this morning, if you'll humor me real quick. Turn around and look at the person next to you. You can give them a little wave, you can say hello to them, smile at them. Just hold them for a second right there in your seat. Take them in. Y'all too at home, wherever you're, wherever you're watching and sitting from, look at the person next to you. You know, there might be a little bit more distance between us right now than we're used to at church. But looking at each other and taking in each other is still special. It's special to greet each other and to show each other love in this way. But sometimes these new distances can be difficult to get used to, right? Sometimes they can still make us feel bad. Sometimes we can sit in a whole crowd of people and still feel like we're alone. And not the good kind of alone, where we might take a nap, or curl up with a good book, or watch TV, or play video games. The kind of alone where we might feel lost, confused, cut off from our friends and family, the kind of alone where we feel like no one understands us, or what we're going through. Friends, that's a, that's a hard feeling. That's tough to feel alone like that, especially when we are surrounded by so many other people. So like with so many other things, Jesus has something to say about this. Jesus tells us, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am also. Now earlier, when y'all looked around at each other, did you, did you see Jesus from where you were sitting? Was he here, sitting among us in person at church? I don't think so. I don't know. He could have been, but I don't think so. I don't think that's what Jesus means when he tells us that he's here. He's not phys physically present with us sitting right here. Although if he does show up to church today or to eat supper with y'all tomorrow, don't tell him I said that. <laughs> and I think Jesus is among us when we're surrounded by those who show us love and light. So friends, my encouragement for you today is that your friends, your family, and your church community are never, ever far away. And because they are never far away, Jesus is never far away. When the people and things of this world let you down, Jesus is never far away. When internet connections go bad and the chaos of Zoom classrooms can be too much, Jesus is never far away. When you might not be able to attend church in person and must listen through a car radio or watch on your computer with us today, Jesus is never far away. When you feel like you're the only person on earth, Jesus is never far away. So friends, I'll ask you to do that thing where you look at your neighbor one more time, but this time, I want you to look at them and tell them Jesus is never far away. So as we go about a new week, let us continue to follow the Jesus who is never far away from us. Will you pray with me this morning? Jesus, when we feel alone, help remind us of your presence. Thank you for never going far away from us. We pray these things in your name. 
Amen. lesson, our gospel lesson for today comes from the gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20, and we hear these words this morning. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. 
Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to travel to Herrenhut in Germany to learn about our Moravian heritage there. Now the flight from Prague back to New York City was a long one. I just spent a week overstimulating my brain with new information and I was feeling pretty jet lagged. I had the window seat, I had a nice, you know those little travel pillows that you put behind your neck, had one of those. And right after takeoff, the sound of the engine was starting to lull me to sleep. But about two minutes into that flight, the peaceful silence was broken. You see, there was a little girl sitting directly behind me, and she had a strong passion for the Pixar film Frozen. Perhaps some of you have seen <laughs> that film. Now, she listened to this Frozen soundtrack, particularly the song, Do You Want to Build a Snowman, all the way to New York from Prague. I know this because she did not use headphones. And if I managed to somehow drown out the music and find myself dozing off, I received a periodic kick to the back of my seat, preventing any sleep from occurring. So, needless to say, every time I see this snowman, I can't help but cringe a little bit. Now, I tell this story because whenever multiple people occupy the same place, it's inevitable that tensions are bound to arise at some point. Disagreements over behavior can be common in our families, in our churches, and in our communities. So this is what Jesus can help us with in the gospel lesson for today. Now what Jesus is asking us to do here isn't easy, especially for the southerners out there. Sometimes we tend to shy away from being direct and open with folks, even when doing so can be beneficial for everyone. I certainly had plenty of opportunities where I could have politely asked that girl on the plane to turn her music down and quit kicking me in the back of my seat. But did I seize those opportunities? No. I never did because I didn't want to be confrontational. How many of you have been in a similar situation before where someone asks you, um, is this bothering you? And while you respond, no, it, <laughs> it's fine. Your inner voice is screaming something very different that I will not say in church. Now, the, the offenses that Jesus is talking about in Matthew 18 probably go a bit deeper than someone listening to the Frozen soundtrack on an airplane. But Jesus doesn't go into much detail about this here. All he says is, if another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault. And so this also gets tricky. Because, again, what about situations where both people believe they're in the right? And in those situations, who gets to determine what is sin and what isn't? I remember being particularly confused growing up when a church member called a friend of mine a sinner when he dressed as Harry Potter for Halloween. Because Harry Potter is actually a series that is full of positive themes like love, self-sacrifice, and friendship, if you take the time to read the books. So it isn't always clear-cut how to define what Jesus means by sin here. And if you remember elsewhere in Scripture, earlier in Matthew 5, Jesus says, You have heard it said, you shall not murder. But I say, don't even be angry with someone. Right? So it's not always clear what Jesus means by sin here. 
Some translations of this passage include the words against you, while others leave those two words out. But whether someone has sinned against you or has just sinned in general, either way, it's not always easy to point out to someone, especially when that is someone you love and respect. It's not always easy to point out that they have strayed. And to further complicate things, one of those key phrases that I always heard teachers say in elementary school was, worry about yourself and not everyone else. Have you heard that said before, maybe? And there is certainly wisdom in that. We shouldn't be so concerned about what others are doing that we neglect what we need to be doing ourselves. However, Jesus' task of correcting those who stray is not just about us as individuals, but as the community of faith as a whole, as Reed mentioned earlier, where two or more are gathered together in Jesus' name. Now, if, if someone was to start blowing an air horn every Sunday during the worship service for some reason, hopefully that don't, don't get any ideas, but having a, a conversation with that individual about alternative ways to express their inner joy would certainly be beneficial to the whole congregation. But as individuals, we do represent the body of the church. So what we do matters. And if the church wants to continue gathering, the members of the church need to be able to tell each other when lines have been crossed. Now, there is a, certainly a good way and a not so good way to correct someone. And Jesus shows us the good way to do this. Firstly, Jesus says, when you are pointing out something someone has done wrong, it should be when you and the person are alone. You shouldn't call them out in front of everyone or embarrass them or make them feel bad. Makes me think of that commercial, perhaps you remember it, where there's the person at the checkout counter in the grocery store and the cashier scans an item and over the intercom it repeats over and over again, wart remover, wart remover, wart remover. There's no need to broadcast that. There's no need to broadcast someone's shortcomings for all to hear. Instead of immediately bringing others into the discussion, just go straight to the person yourself. And if they listen to what you have to say, Jesus points out, you have regained that one. In other words, the whole reason for approaching someone who has strayed isn't to say that you are better than they are. And it isn't to make them feel guilty either, but to bring them back into the community, to maintain a healthy relationship. And Jesus goes on to say, if you are unable to convince the person to change one-on-one, -on -one, then Jesus suggests bringing a couple others along to be witnesses. So basically, Jesus was on to something. He figured out how to do an intervention before it was a show on A&E. But if that doesn't work, bringing, bringing others with you, Jesus recommends bringing the issue to the church. Now, what Jesus doesn't mean here is that every time you can't resolve a personal issue with someone, that you talk about them behind their back with your friends. That's not what Jesus is saying here. And while I certainly enjoy having conversations with all of you, please don't call your pastors every time your neighbor blows, blows their grass into your driveway or plays their bagpipes at 2 a.m. But bringing these issues to the church is the idea here. The idea here is that it's, it's not just the pastor you're bringing these things to, but the whole community is given the task of saving the relationship with the offending person. Now, historically, passages like these have been used to exclude people or excommunicate them from the church. But if you look at the broader context of this passage, that couldn't be farther from the intended meaning. In verse 17, Jesus goes on to explain that if the offending person doesn't even listen to the church community, 
they should be treated as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Folks used to read this and think, well, Gentiles and tax collectors were outcasts from the chosen community, right? So if folks won't listen to the church, they have no business being in the church. That's one argument that could be made. But elsewhere in Scripture, do you remember how Jesus treats those who were outcast by everyone else? He welcomes the outcasts. He has meals with them. He doesn't excommunicate them. He communicates with them. He continues the conversation. He builds relationships. He teaches out of love. So instead of shunning someone with an addiction, the church should help individuals overcome that addiction. When someone is struggling, the church should be there to help them stand up. Now again, this, this can be hard to hear, and this passage can be hard to live out sometimes. It's easier said than done. Because, as you probably know, human relationships are not always simple. They're quite complicated. And there isn't a cookie-cutter solution for every problem that we face. And depending on how serious the circumstance, there may be times where people commit sins against us where we don't feel safe approaching them alone due to the severe nature of those actions. That can happen. People sometimes make bad decisions because of circumstances beyond their control that we can never understand. And sometimes we might not be equipped with the proper skill set to help folks identify their own issues. What's the phrase? You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. So when you feel like someone's actions are harming the community, I would certainly encourage you to proceed with caution as you consider how to reach that person. Take the time to consider how you can lead others to the truth about what they're doing in a tactful way. It's important that we learn how to tell others the truth in our relationships, right? Because that's what makes a relationship authentic. I can't help but think of a particular episode of Andy Griffith here. Perhaps you remember this one. But rather than tell Aunt B that her homemade pickles taste terrible, Andy and Barney end up having to eat several batches of pickles to avoid hurting Aunt B's feelings. And after tasting one of her own kerosene cucumbers, Aunt B realizes her pickles were really bad. And she wishes that Andy would have just told her the truth rather than endure hardship at her hands. Sometimes, like Aunt B, folks, including ourselves, are unaware that their actions are harming others until someone gently points that out. Perhaps this is part of what Jesus is getting at in this Matthew passage today. It's better to be honest with someone about something that bothers you than to spend a lifetime eating bad pickles. And being truthful doesn't have to be hurtful. It's also important to note here that this passage doesn't give Christians a free pass to go around pointing out the faults of everyone they meet. Because Christians are certainly far from perfect themselves. And Jesus starts out in verse 15 by saying, If another member of the church sins against you, right? Another member of the church, not just the random person on the street who doesn't want to be a part of the community. How many of you have been to Laurel Ridge Senior High Camp before? Maybe some of you have. I know a few of you have. At Laurel Ridge Senior High Camp, all of the campers sign a camp covenant every year that outlines rules for how everyone should treat one another. The purpose of this covenant is to keep members of the community accountable to one another, much like the brotherly agreement that helped our ancestors live together in harmony. 
So, when we point out someone's shortcomings, it should be done within our own community for the benefit of our community's health. So now, our challenge is as we go out into the world, we are bound to meet those who sin against us, who grind our gears, who make us feel angry and upset. But Christ invites us to approach these folks with tact and a spirit of love. And if we do that, perhaps forgiveness is on the way. And that's where Matthew's gospel takes us next time. Will you pray with me? Gracious Lord and God, you have called us into community to be love and light to one another. Lord, it is not always easy to correct our brothers and sisters. But Lord, we pray that you will give us the wisdom and strength to know how to do so with tact, with love, and with compassion. Help us to receive insight from our brothers and sisters. Help us to live as a community that not only serves you, but help us to be a community that looks out for one another as well. Guide us in this task this week, this month, and throughout our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our soloist hymn that we close our service with today, Join We All With One Accord, a very familiar hymn to many of us Moravians. I want to draw special attention to the third verse, one in spirit, one in life, one amid earth's frequent strife. I think we've certainly found ourselves in a time of frequent strife this year, but it is certainly my continued prayer that we will continue to seek that oneness that we can find in Christ in all situations, especially those that are dire. Let us reflect on the words to our hymn. Join we with the saints of old, no more strangers in the fold. One the shepherd who was sought, one the flock his blood has bought. One our master, one alone, none but Christ his Lord we own. Brethren of his law are we, as I loved you so. Branches we in Christ the vine, living by his life divine. As the Father with the Son, so in Christ we all are one. One the name in which we pray, one our Savior day by day. With one cup and with one bread, us one. Spirit, one in life, one amid arts frequent strife, one in faith and one in love, one in hope of heaven above. Now receive the benediction and blessing of our Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Jesus, amen. <laughs>